Not the other one. Not the hand mic. Oh, you're going to yes. OK. OK, so welcome back after the coffee break. We have now a special lecture by Jeffrey Shellett that will be recorded. Uh, and the title of his talk is Determining Repetition Thresholds via Logic and Numeration Systems. And I please ask you to deliver your talk. OK, thank you very much. It's uh, a real honor to be here again in Vienna. And uh, I thank the organizers for having invited me to speak. Is the microphone level uh, too loud, too soft? Fine, OK. So uh, I'm going to talk about um, some things that doubtless many of you have heard before. And uh, you know there's a, an old saying about a professor, that a professor is somebody who talks in someone else's sleep. Uh, and uh, this is particularly true when it's a warm afternoon and it's the last talk of the day. So I thought I would start not with my talk, but by giving you all an open problem. Um, and this is a really good audience for this problem because we have people who are interested in ergodic theory here and people who are interested in discrete iterations and numeration systems and all of these come together in my problem. So I'll, I'll just write the problem on the board and then if you've heard me talk about this subject before, you can instead think about my open problem. So, um, so here's my open problem. For, for which I offer 250 euros for any significant progress with the uh, warning that I get to decide whether it's significant progress. Um, so let A and B be integers, 0 less than B less than A, and define B0 equals B, and bn plus 1 is a mod bn for n greater than or equal to 0. And then you can see that uh, each time you compute a mod bn, you're getting something smaller. So this forms a strictly decreasing sequence. And eventually, we have b sub uh, r is equal to 0, right? And then let's define PAB to be R, the smallest R for which this is 0. And the problem is to estimate PAB. And I'll tell you what's known. So, so far, this is known. PAB is big O of A to the 1 third. And furthermore, PAB is greater than or equal to C log A infinitely often. So as you can see, these are widely separated, A to the 1 third and, and log A. So this has been open uh, since 1979. So. Um, with this progress being made in the 90s. Are they constants absolute? I'm sorry? Are they constants absolute? The, this constant? This constant is independent of A and B, yes. Okay. Yeah. The capital is also the implied constant independent of B. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So that's my problem, and I would be very happy to hear about any progress on this problem. OK, so now I'll start the talk. Um, so, uh, here are some of my co-authors on the material that I'll talk about today. So this is, thank you. I get the other one. No, I get it. Um, 
Uh, Asim Baranwal, who's my ma current master's student. James Curry, who's a professor at the University of Winnipeg in Canada. Uh, Lucas Moll, who's a postdoc at Winnipeg. Narad Rampersad, who's a, a professor at the University of Winnipeg. And uh, Elise Van Dome, um, uh, who is where now? I don't know. Sorry? Back at, oh, back at Liège, okay. And um, so these are just some of my co-authors on this material. Um, so uh, I'll talk about repetitions in words. Repetitions in words is a, a topic that's been studied for a very long time, uh, at least since uh, 1906 with this uh, paper of Axel Tue. And it has applications to, to other areas of mathematics and, and computer science. So I, I think it's, um, it's a subject which is beautiful and interesting in its own right, so that one doesn't need to look for applications, but if you're writing grants, it's always nice to mention applications to other areas. Uh, and uh, it's been used in, for example, things as wide as uh, musical composition. Uh, Jean-Paul can tell you a lot about that. And also in uh, chess problems, uh, going back to the Dutch chess master Max Oeuvre. So uh, there's a, a lot of uh, different uh, influences in this area. So the most basic forms of repetitions that I'll talk about, probably familiar to many of you, are the squares, the cubes, and the overlaps. So a square is just a, a non-empty word of the form XX, so a block of letters followed by the same block again. And for example, the German word Nennen is a square. There are not that many squares in German. Uh, I don't think there are any longer ones, but perhaps someone who's more fluent in German can tell me. Um, a word is said to contain a square if some factor, and by that I mean, as we've seen earlier today, a contiguous block inside the word is a square. So here's a German word which is probably unfamiliar to most of you, but it is a legitimate German word. Uh, it's appeared in some German patents. And it is Strebaus, uh, Baussteuerung. Um, so I'm sorry for my pronunciation. Um, uh, and uh, uh, this is referring to automatic control for tracks in a mine. Um, and so in this word you see it has a square in it because it has Baus, Baus twice. Uh, a cube is a non-empty word of the form XXX. And I don't know of any examples that are cubes in German, uh, but the Eng in English we have this sort of word, which is shh, and is spelled like that. Um, and overlap is a word of the form A-X-A-X-A, -A -A, where here A is a single letter, and X is a possibly empty word. And the German word, for example, mer, ends in the overlap R-E-R-E-R. Okay, so a word that avoids squares, uh, we also say that the word is square-free, is one, it has no factor in it that contains a square. So the English word square is square-free, but unfortunately the word square-free is not square-free because it has the square EE -E in it. Okay, so we say that squares are avoidable if, over an alphabet if there exists an infinite word uh, that has no squares in it, so contains no squares. And you, obviously you can't do this over a two-letter alphabet. If you just write out the first uh, four letters, you'll see why. Um, but a, a two-way proved in, a, in an important paper in 1906 that you could do this over an alphabet of size three. And similarly, he, he proved or, that you could avoid overlaps and cubes uh, over zero, one. Okay, so uh, in 1912, he invented what's now called the 2A Morse morphism. So this is the mapping that sends 0 to 0, 1, and 1 to 1, 0. And now we can iterate this morphism, uh, applying it over and over again, and we get this infinite word in the limit, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, and so forth. Uh, which is the infinite 2A Morse word. And this word is a fixed point of mu. So you apply mu to t, you get t again. Okay, um, and, and to a prove that this word avoids overlap. So there's no word of the form AX, AX, A in there. And we can look around, we can see uh, there's one, zero, one, zero. If there were a one there, that would be an overlap, but there isn't a one there. And, and, and indeed, there are no overlaps in this. Okay, so um, 
We can also talk about more general kinds of repetitions. Uh, squares and cubes are integral repetitions of a word, but we can also talk about fractional repetitions. And to do so, we introduce this notion of period. So we say a word is period P, oops, period P if WI is WI plus P for all meaningful I. So for all I that are in the range of the word. And the, the English word alfalfa has period three. Um, and, and a word could have multiple periods, so the period isn't unique. For example, this word A-A-B-A-A-A-B-A, you can think of that as having period four, or it also could be thought of as having period seven. So uh, unfortunately, there's no really good terminology for this, but the, the shortest period is sometimes called the period, uh, which is, uh, I wish we'd pick something else, but that seems to be what people say. And now the exponent of a word is its length divided by the period, the, sh the shortest period. So in particular then, um, alfalfa has exponent seven-thirds, and this German word schematische has uh, exponent three-halves because it has length 12 and period eight. So 12 over eight is three-halves. Um, so you can, you know, if you speak another native language, you can try to think of some interesting uh, repetitions in your language. And I, I collect them as a hobby. So if you have any particularly good ones, let me know. Um, so squares under this definition have exponent two, and cubes have, have exponent three. Okay, now what's the critical exponent? Well, the critical exponent is supposed to be the thing that measures the maximum kind of repetition in a word. So it's the supremum over all finite factors of the exponent of the, the factor f. So it measures the very largest repetition occurring in a word. So if you take the German word wendenen, then it has a, a suffix, which is endenen, and that suffix has exponent 8 thirds. Okay, so... Um, so in the case of an infinite word, this uh, critical exponent could either be attained or not attained. That is, it, it could be that there are larger and larger words that are coming closer and closer to this, this number, or there could actually be uh, a particular finite word that achieves it. So if we look at the infinite Fibonacci word, this is the word that's obtained as the fixed point of this morphism, zero goes to zero, one, and one goes to zero then um, it's an old, the result of Mignosi that this word has critical exponent 2 plus the golden ratio. So 3.618, roughly. Um, and uh, um, we can see, let's see, if we look early on, we should be able to find a, uh, a repetition uh, of, uh, of order uh, 3. Let's see. 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. There's a cube right there. And as we go further and further into this word, we find larger and larger repetitions up to the limit, uh, 2 plus the golden ratio. So there's an example where the, the critical exponent is clearly not attained for this word because no finite factor could have an irrational uh, exponent. Okay, now how about uh, the, the repetition threshold? So uh, the repetition threshold now is, is about a set of words. We have a set of words, S, and we take all the critical exponents, which is a supremum over something, and now we take the infimum of that. So we take the, the, the smallest over all the words in S of this critical exponent. And again, this could be attained or maybe not. So what this is measuring, essentially, is the largest unavoidable repetition in, in the, over all the words in S. So we have this set of words, and we say, okay, in this set, you can't really avoid some repetitions. You need something, and this is the largest unavoidable one. Okay, so uh, RT is sometimes used to represent this. RT of K is the repetition threshold for the set of all words over a K-letter alphabet. So that's the kind of the largest possible set you could look at of words. It's all, every single finite word over a K-letter alphabet. And uh, um, 
uh, squares are not avoidable over this, as we saw, over a two-letter alphabet, um, but overlaps are, and so that means that the repetition threshold is two for, for squares. And Dijon, in 1972, uh, proved that the fixed point of this morphism here uh, has critical exponent seven force. So um, uh, th this is best possible among all uh, words over a three-letter alphabet. And so that shows that this repetition threshold for three letters is seven force. Um, just incidentally, I should mention that uh, th this, uh, uh, this is part of a more general theorem that I'll talk about in a second. And uh, it would be nice, actually, to, to, to have a picture of Francoise Dejean to show you, but I haven't been able to find one. And if anyone knows how to contact her, I would love to be informed about it. Um, okay, so Dijon conjectured uh, in the same paper that the repetition threshold for four letters was seven-fifths, and then after that, these are some exceptional cases at the beginning, after that the repetition threshold was k over k minus one for k greater than or equal to five, and this has been, this was called Dijon's conjecture and now Dijon's theorem, and so this was finally proven in 2009 by the combined efforts of many different people. I hope I haven't left out anybody uh, too important here, uh, but Panzio, Moulin, Olanier, Mohamed Nouri, Curry, Carpi, Rampersad, and Rao put together all their results, and you have a proof of Dijon's theorem. So this is a difficult theorem. It involves some very clever constructions. It involves some uh, very long computations. It's a nice mixture of both theory and, and, and algorithms. OK, so what am I going to do in this talk? What I'm going to do in this talk is discuss uh, the analog of Dijon's theorem, so repetition thresholds, for three different classes of words. So now I'm not looking at all words over a k-letter alphabet but rather uh, just certain words. I'm restricting my attention. And the words that I'm going to look at um, are the balanced words over a k-letter alphabet, and I'll tell you what those are in a second. I'm going to talk about the rich words just over a binary alphabet. Um, and then I'll talk about binary words avoiding what I'm calling anti-squares, which I'll, I'll tell you about that in a minute. Okay, so what makes this appropriate is that um, the, the proofs that I will talk about are proofs that involve numeration systems. So I'm talking about numeration systems, I'm talking about substitutions, although I'm calling them morphisms. I hope that's okay with everyone. And so it fits the theme of this, of this uh, conference. Okay, so let's talk first about balanced words. So what does it mean for a word to be balanced? Roughly speaking, a word is balanced if whenever you look at two factors of the same length of the word, they have roughly the same number of occurrences of all the letters. So there's not a factor that has lots and lots of A's but few B's and another one that has lots and lots of B's but few A's. That can't happen. Uh, to make it a little bit more precise, we'll use this notation absolute value of W sub A, as seen in an earlier talk, um, which is the number of occurrences of the letter A in the word. And then the word is balanced if you pick two factors of the same length, X and Y, any two factors, and it's always the case that the number of A's in these two factors differs by at most one. Okay, so this is kind of the, the best possible. Obviously, it's, uh, it's a little bit unreasonable to demand that they always be exactly the same in their fr letter frequencies. That's, that seems too demanding. But we, we let it vary by as much as one, and we get an interesting class of word. And here's an interesting uh, word from German that's balanced, uh, the word Steuerbefehle. So you can, you can check. And it, you know, it takes a little bit of time to check that that's a balanced word. And the German word, unausgewogen, that is unbalanced, which is nice because that's what it means. It means unbalanced in German. So, um, okay, so now there, it turns out that there's a very nice characterization of the infinite binary balanced words, and that this is essentially a, a set of Sturmian words. So these are words that we've, we've seen them discussed before. So words of the form, uh, real numbers alpha and beta, alpha n plus one beta, you take the floor and you subtract floor of alpha n plus beta, and uh, the same thing, or the same thing with floor replaced by ceiling. 
So um, for larger alphabets, there's a characterization um, that's uh, due uh, independently to uh, Pascal Hubert and to Ron Graham that says that uh, if you want a balanced word over a larger alphabet, what you do is you take a balanced word over the binary alphabet and you look at the zeros in there and you replace the zeros by some word X repeated. So, every, so maybe the word would be 0, 1, 0, 2. So every time you see a zero, you say zero, then the next zero gets one, then the next zero gets zero, the next zero gets two, and so forth. And you do the same thing with the ones. Now you can't just use any old word X. You have to use a certain kind of word called a constant gap word. So let me tell you what that is. A constant gap word is a word that if you take your finite word X and repeat it, and you look at the occurrences of any particular letter, those letters are always separated by the same number of symbols, which, which could depend on the letter. So 0102 is then a constant gap word, because if I write 0102 repeated forever, you see that the zeros occur with gap 2, and the ones occur with gap 4, and similarly, the twos occur with gap four. So this is a constant gap word then. So the gap may depend on the letter. Um, so this nice characterization then lets us build uh, balanced words over a larger alphabet from, from the binary one. So now, um, uh, Narad Rampersad um, and uh, Elise Van Damme and I wrote a paper in which we tried to figure out what the repetition threshold was for these balanced words. So balanced words, as you might imagine, are rather tightly constrained words, right? Because the, the, the letter frequencies must never vary too much, or otherwise it would become unbalanced. Um, and uh, so what we were able to prove, uh, we, we were able to prove in that paper, we proved the first three of these results for k equal two, three, four. That's the size of the alphabet. And then recently with my master's student, we were able to prove for k equal five. And so here are our results. So the, 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 the repetition threshold for Sturmian words, well, we already, that was already known. That's two plus the golden ratio. For words over a three-letter alphabet, it's two plus root two over two. For words over a four-letter alphabet, it's one plus the golden ratio over two. And then recently we were able to prove uh, over a five-letter alphabet, it's, it's exactly three halves. Um, now, I don't know about you, but I don't exactly see a pattern there. Um, but we have a conjecture, which is for k greater than or equal to 5, this repetition threshold is k minus 2 over k minus 3, which looks a lot like De Jong's theorem in the sense that it's some simple rational function of k. So we don't, we don't know how to, to prove that currently. Um, now, I guess I should have said at the very beginning, and I apologize and I'll say it now, is I'm just going to state the results in the first half of the talk. And then in the second half of the talk, what I'll do is I'll tell you how we prove the results. And that's maybe half the fun, at least for me, because uh, for many of these results, we didn't use the standard sit down with a pencil and paper and try to prove them uh, method, but rather we used some automated theorem prover uh, that takes statements in a particular logical language and then proves or disproves the statements. And so part of the fun for me was uh, massaging the statements of what you want into the form that the theorem prover could reasonably prove it and then use the theorem prover. So. Uh, Maybe some people will regard this as cheating. I regard it as fun. Okay, so let's go on to the second class of words that I'll talk about. And these are rich words. So uh, rich words, to understand what a rich word is, you need to remember what a palindrome is, a word that uh, reads the same forwards and backwards, like the German word neben. So it reads the same forwards and backwards. And Droubet, Justin, and Perillo proved that uh, a length N word contains at most n distinct non-empty palindromes as factors. So if a word has this property, it contains the maximum possible number of non-empty distinct palindromes as factors, we call that rich. So let's look at the German word besessen, which is a pretty good word for describing my interest in the topic. Um, usually that got 
more laughs in the past. Um, so it has, look at the palindromes, it has the palindromes B, E, S, and N. Those are sort of the trivial palindromes. Then S, S, E, S, E, S, E, S, and E, S, S, E. So it has nine palindromes, so it's rich. Um, rich words have been studied extensively, and there's some experts in the room on this topic, but to, at least to me, they're still a bit mysterious. And I'll talk at the very end about an open problem on rich words. Okay, so uh, Pelantova and Starosta proved in 2013 that uh, these infinite rich words are constrained in the sense that they have to have a repetition. You have to have at least a square in, in an infinite rich word. And Vesti recently gave upper and lower bounds on the length of the longest finite word that's square-free and rich over a K-letter alphabet. So, you know, as K gets bigger, you get longer and longer words that don't have squares that are rich, but eventually, by this uh, theorem of Pelantova and Starosta, you, you have to get a square eventually. Um, and Vesti pr proposed the problem of determining this repetition threshold. What is the, the repetition threshold for, for infinite rich words? So what we were able to prove is, unfortunately, we weren't able to figure it out exactly, but we were able to prove that, um, that this repetition threshold is between 2.7 and 2.7071. And furthermore, this upper bound is, uh, there's a specific word that achieves this bound of two plus root two over two. It's infinite, it's binary, it's rich, and it has uh, no two plus root two over two repetitions in it. So my guess is that that actually is the correct repetition threshold, but we weren't able to prove that you can't do better. Okay, and now the, um, the third class of words that I'm gonna talk about are the, the words avoiding anti-squares. So for me, an anti-square means a word of the form x, a binary word of the form x, x bar, where x bar means change all the ones to zeros and change all the zeros to ones. Okay, so this is something that looks vaguely like a square, but the second half is complemented. So if you want to try to avoid anti-squares, that is no anti-square factors, then you just can't do it in any interesting way. So the only infinite words that, that avoid anti-squares are zero forever and one forever. Zero to the omega and one to the omega. So this is, this is not so interesting um, and probably not publishable. Uh, and if you, now if you allow a single anti-square, you want to avoid all anti-squares, you allow one. Once again, uh, there's not anything that's very interesting. There's only words of the form zero, one to the omega, which has the anti-square zero, one at the beginning, and one, zero to the omega. But if you allow two anti-squares, for example, zero, one, and one, zero, then things become more interesting. Um, so the first thing that we'll notice is that we can easily write down some sort of expression uh, to show that there are lots and lots of such words. So if you take any word that's a concatenation of 1000 and 10000, you can easily convince yourself that this word has, no, has only two anti-squares in it, namely 0, 1, and 1, 0. And then the same thing, of course, if you repeat uh, this infinitely. So this notation to the omega means uh, Choose any infinite word that is factorizable in terms of 1, 0, 0, 0, and 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. So that, that proves right away there are exponentially many such words of length n, and there are uncountably many infinite words. Okay, so now what we could do is we could say, okay, that, somehow that's, that, that's too generous to just say you want to avoid anti-squares. Um, let's look at what kinds of repetitions we can avoid. So let's ask for what the repetition threshold is for words that avoid anti-squares, except 0, 1, and 1, 0. And it turns out to be, once again, 2 plus the golden ratio. Um, and uh, so uh, now I'm going to try to relate this to the theme of this, uh, of this workshop. So uh, what I claim is that numeration systems can be used to prove all these results that I've just talked about, and probably many more. Um, and the basic idea is the following. The first thing we do is we uh, have some sort of candidate word that we're, we're proposing 
uh, and I can talk a little bit about how that is found. We have a candidate word that, that achieves this, this critical exponent. Um, and we hope that this word is generated by iterating a morphism, just like we did with the 2A Morse word and the Fibonacci word. So we find this word somehow, we find the morphism uh, that generates it, and then what we do is we construct some sort of numeration system. And this numeration system should be based on the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the uh, uh, morphism so that the, this word is automatic. Uh, and I'll say what I mean by that in terms of this morphism. So that means that there's some deterministic finite automaton that given a representation in the numeration system as input would compute the nth letter of the word. And then we expl express some claim about the properties. For example, this word is rich, or this word avoids anti-squares except 0, 1, and 1, 0. We, we express this claim as a first-order logical formula. And then finally, we have some sort of decision procedure. that We, we work in some first-order logical theory for which this theory is decidable. And by decidable, I mean there is an algorithm that will take uh, and a, 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 a logical expression in this first order system and will chug away and eventually it will say true or false. So it turns out that if you, you, you pick these things in the right way, then you're lucky and these things are decidable and then you just type it into your program and it says true or false. So that's my scheme for all three of these results. Of course, you still have to argue that this candidate word is the best possible, right? I'm, I'm only using this to say, here's the candidate that achieves the bound, and we have to have some other argument. Now, sometimes that other argument is just a breadth-first search of the space of, of words, in which case, that's just a, a finite computation also, but not always. Okay, so the special case is the easiest to understand. This is where the morphism is k-uniform. And what do I mean by that? I mean the image of every letter is of the same length, namely length k. And then the appropriate numeration system is just ordinary base k numeration. So that's, that's very easy. And then the corresponding automaton, which I'll call it DFAO, which stands for Deterministic Finite Automaton with Output, can be constructed directly from the morphism. So there's a completely trivial process. It takes the morphism and constructs the automaton. And let's look at an example. So here's the 2A Morse sequence. Um, it is generated by the morphism 0, 1, uh, 0 goes to 0, 1, 1 goes to 1, 0. And now let's try to prove, let's try to redo the results of 2A in his 1912 paper using this, this approach. So we want to know, does this word have an overlap? So first thing we do is we need to write down a first order logical statement saying the word T, the 2A Morse word, has an overlap. Okay, what does it mean to have an overlap? It means that there's some block uh, X and a letter A, so that inside the 2A Morse word, there's a occurrence of A, then X, then A, then X, then A. So if we say, this A is at position K of the 2A Morse word. And we say that the block AX is of length M, which has to be of length at least one. Then what we are saying is, here's this first order logical statement. There exists K and M such that M is at least one. And for all I, if I is less than or equal to M, the symbol at position k plus i is the same as the symbol at position k plus i plus m. So for example, this symbol, k, has to be the same as the, same, as the position, symbol at position k plus m. This symbol at k plus 1 has to be the same as k plus m plus 1. And all the way up to uh, i equals m, at which case we get k plus m is the same as k plus 2m. So there's our first order logical statement. Um, I should say that one advantage to being the last speaker, uh, in addition to being able to put everyone to sleep, is that I can either be shorter or longer than the required time. And if I'm shorter, then everyone is pleased. And if I'm longer, nobody can do anything about it except leave. <laughs> okay, so uh, now we have this finite automaton, and here it is just a two-state automaton. We've seen it before. Here, this is the, the name of the state and the output of the state, which are the same thing. And uh, so we can take all this 
And uh, we can feed this into this software called Walnut, which was written by my student. And this software is written based on ideas of other people, based on the ideas of, of Bouchy and uh, Véronique Prière and other people. And uh, the, the basic idea is this automaton for the sequence, like that 2A Morse automaton, is massaged and transformed by means of the particular logical formula that you present into some other automaton uh, accepting, so the word equivalent shouldn't be there, but into an automaton accepting the representations in some numeration system of the values of the free variable that make the statement true. So if there are no free variables, it either says true or false. And otherwise, it gives you an automaton uh, accept, accepting those free values of the free variables that make it true. Now, there's good news and bad news, and I'll give you the bad news first, is that the running time of this procedure is extremely bad. It is on the order of two to the two to the two to the two to the two to the, where the number of twos is the number of quantifier, quantifier alternations in your formula, and then at the very top there's P of N, which P is a polynomial in the size of your logical formula. Okay, so, and N here is the number of states in your automaton. So you can see that even for like say five alternating quantifiers and a two state automaton, you're gonna get something like two to the two to the two to the two to the two. It's, it's pretty big, right? But that, that's the bad news. The good news is that that's just the worst case behavior. And usually it behaves much better than the worst case. And by usually, I mean in our experience when we actually want to do something. Now, I have no explanation for why it's so much better. Uh, that would be interesting. But um, uh, we're successful almost all the time, more than 90% of the time, on things that we actually want to do. Now, if you just pick a statement at random, I don't guarantee that you're going to get that much success. But... Uh, you do very well, and Michelle also has experimented with these kinds of things and been successful, so, uh, so it, it, it's pretty good. Um, okay, so how do we prove then this? If we want to prove to a statement, and we don't want to go through the proof, which is, you know, a page of case-based reasoning, not too bad, then um, we take this first-order formula, and we uh, just translate it into the language that Walnut understands. Now, luckily enough, the language that Walnut understands is virtually symbol for symbol the same thing. So there's very little translation once you figure out the formula. And here's what it looks like. This is what I type into the program. Here, the E, we, we don't have the backwards E as a font on our keyboard. So we just use capital E. And we don't have a greater than or equal sign, so we replace it by two symbols. And we don't have an and, so we use the ampersand. And we don't have a for all, so we use the capital A. But other than that, everything is exactly the same. We just type that statement in, and it says false. That means there is no overlap. And it does this in, you know, a fraction of a second. So there we can prove the statement and with, you know, very little work. Okay, well, I like that, because I'm lazy. Okay, so can we do the same thing with Dijon's theorem, for the first theorem about, about the three-letter alphabet? Remember that she had this morphism, uh, zero goes to, and now this is, uh, let's see, this is a 19 uniform morphism. Check to see that I didn't make a mistake. That's important. You have to tell the base. So we can, we can translate this into an automaton. It turns into a three-state automaton in base 19. Okay, so we can easily convert that into an automaton. Let's call this D for Dijon. And then uh, we need a formula asserting that there are uh, no repetitions, uh, uh, asserting that there's a repetition of, of bigger than seven-fourths. And here's the formula. So this one's just slightly more tricky to figure out. Here, P is the period and J is the range of indices. And you should check that this is, this is in fact, uh, asserting what I'm claiming. But it's not too hard. And if you run this, then this is one of the exceptions. I ran this on a machine with 50 gigs of storage, and it did not, it, it, it ran out of storage. That's because the space consumption of this routine can be very, very large. It can be two to the two to the two to the two, you know, something really awful. So at that point, do you give up and go home? Well, you could, uh, especially if you live here, it's a much shorter trip. 
Um, but um, instead, let's just replace uh, I plus J by K. You notice here on the right-hand side, we have I plus J and I plus J. And we had this big automaton with 19 transitions for each letter of the alphabet, 0 to 18, because it was base 19. It had that big automaton, and uh, that's where this is... Basically, to, to evaluate this, you need to, uh, the fifth power of that automaton. So there's tons of transitions. So what we'll do is we'll substitute k as i plus j. And then we'll say an equivalent logical statement here. d of k is d of k plus p. See, I've replaced uh, i plus j by k. And then I just say for all k, such that k is i plus j. And now we've used, moved this to before the implication and the big automaton is gone, and now it, 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 it only took 170 seconds, and it only took 15 gigs on a Linux machine. So, uh, so we proved Dijon's theorem for alphabet size three. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not, I, I, I'm not uh, I'll say all the claims I'm not making. First of all, it's not original. It's due to people like Bouchy and Briere and others that have worked on this. Second, I don't claim that we can prove everything. Uh, Third, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, it, it might take a while and you might need a fairly large machine, but the advantage is that you can prove these things with very little work sometimes, and you can use it as a tool to investigate what might be true if you're not really sure. Uh, and uh, so, so I think it's yet another tool that we have to, to do things like that. The only original part, really, is that we dared to implement it even though the worst case running time was so terrible and everybody said it wouldn't work. So that's the, that's the only contribution. Um, okay, so let's go to balanced words. I gave you the result on balanced words. Um, so the candidate word is given by a morphism. We can check whether it's balanced with a first order logical formula. So, so we make this assertion, not only is the word have this repetition, we already seen how to check that, but also that the word is balanced. That's something we can also check. We don't have to prove that. So we need a first order uh, statement that says that a word is balanced. Now that seems challenging, right? Because the definition of balanced was you take any two factors of the same length, you count the number of occurrences of each letter and compare them, and they can't differ by one. But how do you count them? Not obvious how to count the number of occurrences of a particular letter with a first order logical formula, right? So if the word is binary, we can do this because there's an alternative characterization of what it means to be balanced. It says a word is unbalanced if and only if it has two factors, one of which looks like 0 w0 zero, and the other that looks like 1 w1. So if you can find two factors like that, clearly it is unbalanced, right? Because one word has the zeros in those places, the other word has the ones. Um, but furthermore, it's an if and only if. So that is a, that is a first order property. We can assert that and write a, a logical formula for it. Okay, um, now, so far I just talked about base k and I gave a few examples of this. How about uh, what if it's not base k? So if the morphism is not uniform, then the corresponding numeration system is not base k numeration. It depends on the structure of the morphism. And everything we've done depends crucially on the ability to implement addition in the numeration system. And not all numeration systems can you implement addition with a finite automaton. So um, one system that where you can do this is the so-called Fibonacci numeration system where you express numbers as a sum of Fibonacci numbers using digits 0 and 1, and you disallow two consecutive Fibonacci numbers in the representation. And it turns out that there's an automaton. You give it x, y, and z in this Fibonacci numeration system, and it can check whether z is equal to x plus y. And more generally, if you want to know whether or not you can do this, on a particular numeration system. Uh, there's a very large class of numeration systems in which you can do that, and that's the Pizot numeration system due to work of Christian Fruny and, and her co-authors over many years. So, so uh, um, uh, there's lots of nice results in those papers, and, and, and one could implement uh, the, the, the algorithms in those papers to do addition. 
Okay, so let's, let's, let's talk about this critical exponent then. Um, suppose I have a word generated by a numeration system, uh, generated by an automaton in some numeration system, and I want to know what the critical exponent of the word is. Well, for uniform morphisms, we know how to do this. There's a procedure due to my student Luke Schaefer um, and me in a paper uh, for, for this case. And more generally, we don't know how to do this uh, um, you know, in all cases. Um, uh, for many enumeration systems, what we can do is something like the following. We, we take our word and we write a logical formula for some uh, exponent, rational exponent, that's close to what we want. And uh, uh, then we ask what period lengths correspond to this exponent. And usually these are rare and fairly easy to describe. And then we, we, we say, okay, let's find the maximal words with this period maximal length L corresponding to the period, and then uh, these again are fairly rare, and then we can just look at the automaton and compute the supremum of L over P, and that has worked for us. Although in general, we don't know how to do this. Um, so we were able, to, using this, we were able to do the balanced words for, for uh, alphabet size two, three, four, and five. For two, three, and four, we needed to do more work because um, in those alphabets, uh, uh, the, the critical exponent was an irrational number, and we could not simply do a breadth-first search um, below that because uh, that would only get finite words, and we somehow need to handle infinite words in that case, so we had to do a little more work, but th th this was possible. For, rep for uh, our most recent result, which is alphabet size 5, the repetition factor, it turns out to be 3, the th sorry, threshold, turns out to be three halves, and then you could just do a finite breadth-first search to cover all words with smaller, smaller exponent. Okay, um, so now let's go back to rich words. So for rich words, uh, remember the definition. It means it has the maximum possible number of uh, non-empty palindromes as factors. And so uh, once again, uh, is, is it clear that... Uh, that this is something that's decidable, with a, expressible and using a first order formula? And the answer is yes. It, it turns out to be equivalent to uh, the fact that every non-empty prefix has a palindromic suffix that didn't appear earlier in the word. And so that's a first order property. Um, so we can verify then, given a candidate word, we can verify that it's rich. And so here's our word. It's a word that you generate it in two steps. So first, you iterate this morphism H, which is over a three-letter alphabet, and you get an infinite word as the fixed point of H. And then finally, you apply this morphism G at the very end. So that's our candidate word. And I've been uh, 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 told by people who know more than me, uh, like Professor Palantova, that this is a, a famous word in the... In the uh, the literature already, so uh, it perhaps is one of a, a larger class of candidate possible words. Um, and it turns out that this word is automatic where we have to use a different numeration system, the so-called Pell numeration system. The Pell numeration system is just like Fibonacci numeration system, except it's built on a slightly different linear recurrence. Um, so we can compute the critical exponent of this word, which turns out to be 2. Uh, 707, 2 plus root 2 over 2, and we do that with this, this slightly heuristic method that I said, but it's not too hard. And then we can also verify that it's rich. Um, and then breadth-first search shows that there's no infinite binary rich word with critical exponent less than, than 2.700, and, and so we get uh, uh, this, these bounds. Uh, unfortunately, we weren't able to really improve that. Uh, I would be interested in knowing if anybody has ideas about how to get better bounds. Uh, so we still don't know whether this 2 plus root 2 over 2 is optimal, but that's our conjecture. OK, and so the last thing I'll talk about then is about uh, words avoiding anti-squares. So remember, this is words of the form x, x bar. So what we're going to do, if we want to figure out the critical exponent, is the critical exponent we're guessing is 2 plus the golden ratio, so about 3.618. 
So what we'll do is to go a little bit higher and look at a rational exponent. And just a little bit bigger than 3.618 is 3.6666, which is 11 thirds. So we'll look at words that avoid anti-squares and have repetitions at most 11 thirds. And then it turns out that there's a dichotomy. There's words with lots of zeros and few ones and words with lots of ones and few zeros, so we just pick one. Let's look at the words with more zeros than ones. And it turns out that these words have a very nice property. These words can be factored into blocks that look like 0, 0, 0, 1, and 0, 1, up to short prefix and suffix. So we can write such words as x1, h of x2, x3, with x1 and x3 short, and this morphism, h. OK, so now you have this new word, x2. It turns out that this word can also be factored. This word can be factored in terms of a short prefix and suffix and a different morphism. And now we get a word y2. And now, uh, if this one went on forever, getting a different morphism each time, we'd be in trouble. But we don't. We, we now get a, fi a fixed point in some sense, because y2 itself can be similarly factorized in the same way that x2 was. So we just keep using the morphism g and g. And so uh, this y2 has a factorization in terms of g. And so putting this all together, it says that a sufficiently large finite word has a factor that looks like h of g to the i of 0 for some sufficiently large i. And hence, the critical exponent of all these words is just going to be the critical exponent of this word h of g omega of 0. And so now we can verify, using walnut again, that the critical exponent is what we said, namely 2 plus the golden ratio. And we can also, with a first order property, we can say that this, wor this word has no anti-squares except 0, 1, and 1, 0. And so we prove that every binary infinite word, avoiding all anti-squares, except these very short ones, has critical exponent at least 2 plus tau, and that's best possible. So you can see there, we had to do a little bit of work to, to, uh, to, to, in addition to just writing a first order formula, but that was, a, that was a, an important part of, of what we were doing. Okay, so um, now uh, you've seen three examples. What would be the future prospects? Well, I'll start with two things that we're hoping to do in the near future. And first is to try to compute the critical exponents for words other than base k numeration system. So there's a certain property of base k numeration system that makes the critical exponents easier to compute, and which is not true, for example, for Fibonacci numeration system or other quadratic piezo numeration system, which makes it harder for us to, to do this. Um, but, you know, hopefully we can do this. And the other is something exciting, which is just being written down now, which is it turns out that the first order theory of the Sturmian words is decidable. So a lot of the things that you want to prove about Sturmian words, that they're balanced, that they have complexity n plus 1, all of this can be decided just by writing down the appropriate logical formula and running it through a program. And furthermore, we can do a lot more than that. We can do things about, let's look at Sturmian words whose slope is given by a continued fraction, whose terms or partial quotients are, let's say, powers of two. That's a weird and interesting class of numbers. Can you say anything interesting about it? If you can state your theorem in first order logic, you can verify this now, in principle, because we haven't actually built the program. but. Um, so this is work uh, based on work of my student, Luke Schaefer, and uh, Hieronymi at uh, Illinois and other people. So not, we don't have the paper yet, but that's, I'm announcing the result. Um, okay, open problems, and I would love to hear any solution to these. First, to prove that our conjecture about the repetition threshold for infinite balanced words. Uh, this is a great combinatorial problem for any combinatorialist here which is just count the number of length and rich binary words. So there are upper and lower bounds known, uh, but they're widely separated. So this seems like a, a pretty basic theorem in the theory of rich words to understand how many there are, and nobody knows how to do that currently. And then finally prove that this uh, repetition threshold for binary rich words is indeed what we claimed it was, 
2 plus root 2 over 2, and then figure out what the analogous results for larger alphabets uh, should be. And we don't even know what the right conjecture is. So with that, I'll thank uh, everyone again for uh, coming on the last talk of the day, which is always an ordeal, I know. And a special thanks to everyone who stayed uh, awake. And uh, I'm open for your questions. Thank you very much for your talk. Are there any questions or remarks? Yes, I have one. For Sturmian sequences, how could you implement a procedure uh, when the Sturmian is coming from a non-computable number? Yeah, so it's a good question. And the answer is that you have to, we have to be very precise about what it is what we're asserting. And what we are asserting is when you talk about a particular number, you give the partial quotients and the Ostrowski representation of the number you are interested in in parallel at the same time. And therefore, you can only meaningfully make assertions when the n that you are specifying is less than or equal to the partial quotient of the continued fraction that you have given in parallel. But luckily, uh, the Ostrowski representation will always uh, be of exactly the right size, and so this allows us to do this. But th the exact precise statement of what we are saying needs to be completely clarified to, to have it be meaningful. Yeah. I have two questions, if I'm allowed to ask two questions. First of all, your first album problem, and more precisely on, on the slide number 15, I guess, uh, for k equal 2 and k equal 4, you have 2 plus a uh, golden ratio and 1 plus a golden ratio over 2. So is that some pattern like? I mean, you go for It's a, the exceptional set at the beginning. So, uh, so I mean, is, is there a trivial argument for which this quantity tends to 1 when k goes to infinity? Uh, I think that should be probably easy to prove, but I, I, I never even thought about it. So. Um, Yes, I think I think I think it is the. Uh, I think you should be able to do that. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. And my second question, if I'm allowed to, is about uh, slide number thirty, maybe. Uh, okay. Oops. I did the wrong button, and I was warned not to. Okay, let's try it again. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just yeah. Okay. So if I'm not mistaken, the, the last statement you can also suppose that W is palindrome and this is equivalent. That, that there's what? That w it's a palindrome, but you don't need to. That just makes the, co the formula more complicated. Uh, that, that was my question. But does it help to, to, no. to restrict it? No, it just makes the formula more complicated, yeah. So, yeah. Any further questions? My question concerns the slide 37. <laughs> when you spoke about avoiding anti-squares, you said that you consider uh, 37, uh, the density of letter zero is bigger than the density of letter one. Well, I didn't catch why you do not consider when the density of both letters are one half. I'm sorry, say, say again, is that the zero, more zeros more, than ones? Is that the question, the more zeros than ones? No, 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 when the, there is, the density of letter zero is the same as the density of letter ones. They can't happen. Not, not for long words. It, it splits. Uh, I mean, I can't prove it a priori, but I mean, if you, if you look at such words, you see that for short words, yes, you can get equal density of zeros and ones, but as long words get longer, they gravitate into two disjoint sets. Uh, and so. 
Uh, the other, uh, th so the point is that uh, this factorization in terms of blocks of 0, 0, 0, 1, and 0, 1, for the other words, it's factorizations in terms of 1, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 0. Yeah. Maybe I didn't understand your question. I'm sorry. Yeah. Any further questions? Then let's thank the speaker thank you. again. Thank you. Thank you.